So over the past five years, I've been working on a new type of artificial intelligence that the popular media has referred to as the robotic scientist. In fact, if you search Google for robotic scientists, you'll see pictures like this here. Here's a, a robotic head that's kind of looking at a microscope that is powered by itself. Or you have this kind of cartoonish robot in a lab coat holding beakers and test tubes. Or you have this very scientific looking light bulb here with a white jacket and a clipboard, the epitome of a real scientist. But when I, when I say the word uh, robotic scientist, what I really mean is something like this. So this is a picture of a, a, a program you can download that I've worked on uh, for quite some time. It's called Eureka. And what it does is it looks at data and it distills out the fundamental mathematical properties of your data. And the idea is, the goal of this project is to turn anyone into a mathematical genius. You give it your data, it figures out all the details, does all the work for you, so that you uh, can come away with a model and a deeper understanding of that data to help you answer, to ask the right questions, to accelerate your research, and set you on the right path towards uh, uh, making new discoveries and new breakthroughs. So I'd like to ask you guys a couple really quick questions to make sure you're awake for this talk here. So I want you to imagine that you are a computer algorithm, and what you have here are these data points. You have y versus x, and this is all you have. It's some experimental data that you've collected, possibly from satellites or something else. So think about it as a computer. How, what is the equation that actually produced this data? Does anyone have a, an, a guess at what might have produced this data? Don't be shy. You have a guess? What is it? X squared. Yes. So you guys are awake. That is the right answer. Another one. This one's a little more difficult. Think like a computer here. Again, it has some sort of oscillating uh, a pattern here. You can imagine if you think about this for a long time, you maybe uh, hire a couple of PhDs or postdocs, you might be able to figure this out, right? Does anyone have a guess? A guess. Man, you are, must be good. What do you think? Very close. X times cosine of X. This is a really smart group. <laughs> okay, well, this is the last one. This one's a little bit harder. And uh, think about this one for a while. It's kind of a step function here. It has an oscillating pattern on it. I've also added some noise here. Does anyone have an idea what this system might be? What is the equation behind this data? I'm looking over here, but does you have a guess? Very, very, you're on the right track, but you're missing a, a term here. All right, let me show you what the right answer was. Did anyone have this? <laughs> so this was uh, x times cosine of 4x plus basically what is the logistic function here, 1 over e to the negative 4x, right? So you are very, very close. I'm, no one has ever gotten this before when I've even the talk. So what happens, what, uh, what you guys are just doing is called symbolic regression. And you're trying to identify a system giving data, and not only uh, any system, but the simplest possible explanation for the data. And you imagine that you guys are able to do these pretty well for uh, one dimension. Imagine if I showed you data in 100 dimensions, or 1,000 dimensions, or a million dimensions. It gets really, really difficult for us to think about what are these equations. Even if you hire every postdoc in the world, you might not be able to understand this system. But this is, a, this is a problem that computers can do extremely efficiently. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So symbolic regression is basically a computer algorithm that works with, to optimize a mathematical expression, like an equation here. And the way we represent these is a binary tree. You can think of this like a parse tree. And we hold this in computer memory. What we do is we mutate and, and perturb these, these, these sub-branches, which are sub-expressions in an equation, and we search the space of, of trees, given a set of building blocks, like sign, multiply, add, and divide, in order to explain data in the simplest possible way. And if you start off with initially random equations to fit this data, you get a really poor fit. But as you perturb these, they get slightly better and better, and it's kind of like asking 20 questions. Eventually, you narrow down onto the precise model here. And the solutions get better and better as you evolve these terms. But this is a very open-ended problem. The search space for equations is huge. It's, it's infinite and it grows exponentially. So how do we actually implement this sort of software? And the, the approach that works extremely well is based upon natural evolution, particularly Darwinian selection and, and survival of the fittest. And instead of animals and organisms competing, to replicate, we have equations that are competing to explain the data in the simplest possible way. So it seems almost impossible that we can optimize these, these equations, 
but this approach works extremely well. You really hone in to, to these very strong signals, and we can pick out the, the exact mathematical relationships that are, are driving most of our data sets. So you start off with random equations down here. This is kind of a tree of life. And as you evolve this, it branches off into simpler expressions. And at these leaves, we have a kind of a final set of hypotheses that we can choose from, from uh, to explain different approximations, different uh, features, and different behaviors in our data set. But there's a big trade-off between the, the size of a great scientific theory is both um, simple and accurate, right? It's very beautiful in a sense that it's, it's, you can write it down on a piece of paper, you can understand it. So the algorithm is, is very aware of this, and the idea is we're going to look for everything. You could have a, a, a new expression, a new equation to explain your data that's extremely complicated and extremely accurate, but it's really difficult to understand what this actually means. At the other end of the spectrum, we could have a, an equation up here, which is extremely simple. This is just a, a one-dimensional linear model that is extremely simple, easy to understand. You can look at this and immediately know that all the dynamics are dependent on theta, theta 2. But what we're really interested in is this, this compromise in between where we have a really simple expression that's also extremely accurate. And this, this is a, called a Pareto front. This is all the trade-offs between accuracy and simple. And what we tend to look for in this, this algorithm is this, this knee point, this cliff point, where you have this dramatic increase in the accuracy for uh, just slightly more complex behavior. And this is where we tend to find the deep underlying uh, uh, fundamental properties of nature directly from raw experimental data. So what can you do with this? So a lot of my research was on developing uh, algorithms and making this sort of approach work well on, on higher and more scaled up problems. And one of the things we, we applied it to was dynamical systems, particularly in biology. So we might give it data of a, uh, here is uh, yeast metabolism or yeast glycolysis, and this metabolic data. And what we can do is we can infer the rate equation for each chemical that's taking place in this yeast cell. And if we do that, we get a set of, of, of ordinary differential equations that encode the exact relationships and the exact chemicals that are interacting synergetically or repressing each, each reaction. And going from these equations, it's a simple matter to reconstruct the, the network because the differential equations encode all the causal information and then we can go in and verify. We can knock out part of these branches here and show that this is actually uh, the true model was, was derived from here. So another uh, extension of this, this has happened just recently, is people have built here at Vanderbilt University this lab on a chip. And what we can do is we can automatically generate this lab on the chip very, very uh, uh, quickly. And we can generate a set of hypotheses and equations to explain, to explain the data that, and the, the dynamics that are taking place in the chip. And then what we can do is close the loop. We can make a prediction on what this model is, and then send it, choose these equations, send it back into the system, and test if that model is actually true. And we can repeat this step, and you can go have a, have a coffee while this system is figuring out the, the science behind your, your biological system here. And this research is actually pioneered by uh, Josh Bongard here at, at, at UVM. Um, and it's, it's being implemented now, which is really, really exciting. So this might be the future of how scientific research is done. You, uh, you set up the system, you pick the building blocks, you choose what to look for, and you let the algorithm and the system figure out the details. Now you can also do this with, with mechanical systems. Here's some examples of looking at very similar systems where you can pick out patterns, things you might pick out right out from a, a physics textbook. You can model uh, sources of noise in data. You can uh, uh, find out what is causing noise in your measurements, for example. You can look at stochastic systems, all the same approaches you can use to find stochastic reaction networks. So this is a very broad application of this. And you can also look at uh, similarly like raw biological data. We look at the derivatives here and explain the, the behavior of, of the system, not just the chemistry. So all the examples I just gave you are explicit models where you're trying to predict something. You're rewarding models such that they can predict the future. But a much more interesting question is to ask not what will happen next in the system, but what doesn't change in the system. Not how this pendulum changes, but what doesn't change about this system. And what makes this question really interesting is that one thing that does not change is the total energy of a swinging pendulum is conserved. But other things are also conserved, like my bank account is not changing. Um, the, the color of, of the paint on the wall is not changing appreciably to the swinging of this pendulum. So it's a really difficult problem to find things that are 
unchanging? How do you find an equation that is constant over time? If you give this problem to an algorithm, the first thing it does is it, it spits back the answer 42 or some other constant value that's trivial, it's really boring. So what we did is we figured out a way to find the most interesting and the meaningful conserve equations in variant relationships. And what we discovered when we were able to do this is, is that when you can do this from conservation laws, you get really deep physical and chemical and scientific insight into the problem. It's much deeper than just a predictive model. So you can go directly from data to a conservation law that encodes a property of the universe that holds for all pendulums through anywhere in the world. So this is what we did. We looked at a double pendulum. And we, this is a, an example of a chaotic system, uh, which is very difficult to predict the future. But you can predict the, the conservation properties of this double pendulum very, very accurately. So this is, a real, this is the actual system we used. This is the actual data that we collected. It's actually much, this, much more complicated than this, but this is zoomed in. And then we let the algorithm think about this data for, it took about 40 hours, and then it out popped this result here, this, this conservation relationship. And if you look closely at this, this is the sum of kinetic and potential energy terms for the, the arm, the bottom arm, and the, the swinging of the elbow itself. And this is actually the Hamiltonian equation. So we can go directly from data to conservation of energy. And this is our setup for the motion tracking lab. This is me in our motion tracking lab. And here's the double pendulum here. And I have these, these infrared markers on here, and these cameras are, are almost experimenting on me as I swing this thing around. And it's watching the, these markers move, and it collects data all on its own, and then it's, it thinks about that data. How did, this, how did this double pendulum behave? What did it do? And it thinks about this data to try to figure out what is the simplest possible invariant relationship that's non-trivial, that's interesting. And that is the result it gets. And you can repeat this for all kinds of systems. You get different types of invariants depending on what type of data you give it. So you can find things like Hamiltonians, Lagrangian equations, uh, equations of motion. I'd even figured out that a pendulum, the arm, is actually confined to a circle. And that is actually a conserved quantity, the, the radius of that circle. And, and many other relationships that are, are, are still being published. So one of the more exciting things that I'm working on now is um, we want to make this this technology universal so that anyone can employ this. A lot of you may have Excel spreadsheets or data sets open on your computers right now at home. And we want to be able to allow you to uh, build a new type of citizen science where you can actually make larger leaps without having to hire a PhD, hire a postdoc, or if you're just not inclined to do this, we can go, uh, 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 we can accelerate our understanding by using this software. And the software is called Eureka, and it's basically really simple. It's a spreadsheet, you paste your data in, and it thinks about your data for a while, you come back, and it gives you every little approximation or, or, or trend in the data to help you understand it further. And what's really exciting about this is we, we launched this about a year ago, and now um, you can go to Google Scholar and you can search for the word Eureka and see how many papers have come out that are using Eureka. And right now it's about 50 to 100. And so it's really exciting. There's results in cutting edge research that are coming directly out of the software. So we're helping people make strides they normally would not be able to take on their own. And I actually point out, you can, you can download this for yourself. It's completely free. It even integrates with the cloud if you want to save some time and, and uh, get your results faster or analyze even more difficult systems. So in conclusion, the software is ready to go. The technology is here. I encourage you to go out and download your own robotic scientists. Thank you very much. <laughs>